Welcome to this session on the history of the EU and its legislative structure. The European Union is a very unique economic and political union between about 28 EU countries that together cover much of the European continent. The predecessor of the EU was created after the Second World War. The first steps were to foster economic cooperation, the idea being that countries that trade with one another become economically interdependent and so more likely to avoid conflict. The result was the European Economic Community, or the EEC. This was created in 1958, and initially, increasing economic cooperation uh, began between six countries, Belgium, Germany, France, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Since then, about 22 other members joined, and a huge single market, also known as the internal market, has been created. What began as a purely economic union has evolved into an organization spanning policy areas from climate, environment, and health to external relations and security, justice, and migration. A name change from the European Economic Community to the European Union, the EU, in 1993 reflected this. So let's take a look at a little history to see how the EU really came to be. We start back in 1945, uh, the beginnings of cooperation between uh, different countries within Europe. The EU is set up with the aim of ending the, at that time, pretty frequent and bloody wars between neighbors, which culminated in the Second World War. In 1950, the European coal and steel community began to unite European countries economically and politically in order to secure lasting peace. The six founding countries again, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. In the 1950s, there, the area was kind of dominated by a Cold War between East and West. Protests in Hungary against the communist regime are put down by Soviet tanks in 1956. In 1957, the Treaty of Rome creates the European Economic Community, the EEC, also known as the Common Market. From 1960 to 1969, Europe saw a period of economic growth. The 1960s was a good period for the economy, helped by the fact that EU countries stopped charging custom duties when they traded with each other. They also agreed on joint control over food production, so everybody would have enough to eat. And soon there was even a surplus in agricultural produce. 1968 pretty much became famous for student riots in Paris, and many changes in society and behavior became associated with the so-called 68 generation in Europe. From 1970 to 1979, again the community in Europe was growing, and it's known as what we call the first enlargement. Denmark, Ireland, and the United Kingdom joined the European Union on January 1st of 1973, raising the number of member states to nine. The short yet brutal Arab-Israeli War of October 1973 resulted in an energy crisis and economic problems for Europe. The last right-wing dictatorships in Europe come to an end with the overthrow of the Salazar regime in Portugal in 1974 and the death of General Franco of Spain in 1975. The EU regional policy starts to transfer huge sums of money to create jobs and infrastructure in poorer areas. The European Parliament increases its influence in EU affairs, and in 1979 all citizens can, for the first time, elect their members directly. The fight against pollution intensifies in the 1970s. The EU adopts laws to protect the environment, including the notion of the polluter pays, for the first time. 1980 to 1989 saw a changing face of Europe, especially with the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Polish Solidarity Movement and its leader Lech Walesa became household names across Europe and the world following some shipyard strikes in the summer of 1980. In 1981, Greece becomes the tenth member of the EU and Spain and Portugal follow ten, five years later. In 1986, the Single European Act is signed. This is a treaty which provides the basis for a vast six-year program 
aimed at sorting out the problems with the free flow of trade across EU borders and thus creates the single market. There's major political upheaval when, on no the 9th of November, 1989, the Berlin Wall is pulled down and the border between East and West Germany is opened for the first time in 28 years. This leads to the reunification of Germany when both East and West are united in October of 1990. With the collapse of communism across Central and Eastern Europe, Europeans become closer neighbors. In 1993, the single market is completed with the four freedoms, the freedom of goods, movement of goods, services, people, and money. The 1990s is also the decade of two treaties, the Maastricht Treaty on European Union in 1993 and the Treaty of Amsterdam in 1999. People are concerned about how to protect the environment and also how Europeans can act together when it comes to security and defense matters. In 1995, the EU gains three more new members, Austria, Finland, and Sweden. A small village in Luxembourg gives its name to the Schengen agreements that gradually allow people to travel without having their passports checked at the borders. Millions of young people study in other countries with EU support. Communication is made easier as more and more people start using mobile phones and the Internet. When we get to 2000 to 2009, we see more expansion. The euro is now the new currency for many Europeans. During the decade, more and more countries adopt the euro. On September 11, 2001, the date becomes synonymous with the war on terror after hijacked airliners are flown into buildings in New York and Washington. EU countries begin to work on much more closely together to fight crime and the political divisions between East and West Europe are finally declared healed when no fewer than 10 new countries joined the EU in 2004, followed by Bulgaria and Romania in 2007. A financial crisis hits the global economy in September of 2008, and the Treaty of Lisbon is ratified by all EU countries before entering into force in 2009. It provides the EU with modern institutions and more efficient working methods. From 2010 until today, we see a very challenging decade. The global economic crisis strikes hard in Europe. The EU helps several countries to confront their difficulties and establishes the banking union to ensure safer and more reliable banks. In 2012, the European Union is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Croatia becomes the 28th member of the EU in 2013. Climate change is still high on the agenda and leaders agree to reduce harmful emissions. European elections are held in 2014 and more Euroskeptics are elected into the European Parliament. A new security policy is established in the wake of the annexation of Crimea by Russia. Religious extremism increases in the Middle East and various countries and regions around the world, leading to unrest and wars which result in many people fleeing their homes and seeking refuge in Europe. The EU is not only faced with the dilemma of how to take care of them, but also finds itself the target of several terrorist attacks. So within that environment, let's describe the institutional setup of the EU. The EU's broad priorities are set by the European Council, which brings together national and EU-level leaders directly elected um, MEPs represent European citizens in the European Parliament. The interests of the EU as a whole are promoted by the European Commission, whose members are appointed by national governments. Governments defend their own country's national interests in the Council of the European Union. The European Council sets the EU's overall political direction, but has no powers to pass laws. Led by its president and comprising national heads of state or government, and the president of the commission, it meets for a few days at a time at least twice every six months. There are three main institutions involved in EU legislation. The European Parliament, which represents the EU citizens and is directly elected by them, the Council of the European Union, which 
represents the governments of the individual member countries. The presidency of the Council is shared by the member states on a rotating basis. And the European Commission, which represents the interests of the Union as a whole. Together, these three institutions produce through the ordinary legislative procedure the policies and laws that apply throughout the EU. In principle, the Commission proposes new laws and the Parliament and Council adopt them. The Commission and the member countries then implement them and the Commission ensures that the laws are properly applied and implemented. Regulations and decisions become binding automatically throughout the EU on the day they enter into force. Directives must be incorporated by EU countries into their national legislation. If national authorities fail to properly implement EU laws, the Commission can launch a formal infringement procedure against the country in question. If the issue is still not settled, the Commission may eventually refer the case to the European Court of Justice. Speaking of courts, in most member states there are three different branches of courts. Generally those courts can be identified as these, ordinary courts, specialized courts, and courts dealing with constitutional matters. The ordinary courts usually deal with disputes in civil matters, such as disputes between citizens or between citizens and businesses. They could also deal with criminal matters. In addition, many member states have established courts for specific matters, such as disputes between public authorities and citizens or businesses. Moreover, various member states have an institution or court to ensure that their constitution is respected. Many of these courts or institutions can be asked to verify whether a certain law or a legislation is in line with the constitutional requirements. The Court of Justice of the European Union, or CJEU, interprets EU law to make sure it is applied in the same way in all EU countries and settles legal disputes between national governments and EU institutions. It can also, in certain circumstances, be used by individuals, companies, or organizations to take action against an EU institution if they feel it has somehow infringed their rights. The CJEU is divided into two courts, the Court of Justice, which deals with requests for preliminary rulings from national courts and takes certain actions for annulment and appeals, and the General Court, which rules on actions for annulment brought by individuals, companies, and in some cases EU governments. In practice, this means that the court deals mainly with competition law, state aid, trade, agriculture, and trademarks. Each judge and advocate general is appointed for a renewable six-year term jointly by national governments. In each court, the, judge, the judges select a president who then serves a renewable term of three years. Now, this video will also give you a little overview of how the CJEU works. Ensuring that EU law is respected throughout the EU is the job of the Court of Justice of the European Union. But how does it do this? This one institution actually has two distinct courts. The Court of Justice, which is the Higher Court, and the General Court. The Higher Court, the Court of Justice, is made up of one judge from each EU member state. Not all judges hear every single case. Each case is allocated to a chamber. The number of judges present reflects how important or complicated the case is. The judges are supported by Advocates General. Like judges, the Advocate General sits on the bench and hears the parties. They then give their own impartial opinion on a legal solution to the case, before the judges themselves decide. These chambers deal with a wide variety of subject matters. A fundamental role of the court is to answer questions from national judges about how EU law should be interpreted. This allows all national courts to apply EU law in the same way. Another of its main functions is to settle disputes that occur between different EU institutions. The European Commission can also bring cases against a member state who it believes has infringed EU law.
The general court has more judges. They too sit in chambers of different sizes depending on the importance and complexity of the case. The general court hears cases brought by individuals or companies wanting to overturn a decision made against them by an EU institution. It also deals with cases brought by member states against decisions taken by the Commission. This means that, whilst the General Court hears cases on a wide variety of matters, cases about trademarks, competition law, agriculture, and anti-terrorist legislation and sanctions feature heavily. Any official language of the EU can be used in front of both courts with the court providing translation and interpretation where necessary. Rulings are published in all EU languages so that all citizens can read them and see how the European law protects us.